Commissioner Designate Muadesh, I'll get it right eventually, uh, Mrs. Carvalho, Secretary General Leonor, ladies and gentlemen, let me first of all thank Ms. Beleza, President of the Champalimo Foundation, for hosting this event. I would also like to um, welcome the pa panelists that will join the stage later Professor Bretteler, Professor Gazer, Professor Yonath, and Dr. Costa, and all of you who will help to discuss this very important question how will we keep healthy? Of course, 10 minutes isn't really enough to do justice to such a crucial and wide-ranging question, and one that affects every man, woman, and child in Europe and beyond. So I will rely on our panelists to bring their expert views on the future of medical and health research and how it will continue to improve lives. I plan to set the scene by highlighting how over the last decade, the EU has encouraged a collaborative approach to research at European level to some of our biggest health challenges and to discuss how this work paves the way forward. The European Union has been a partner for health research and innovation since the very first framework programme which began, as you heard earlier, 30 years ago. Most recently, the seventh framework programme, better known as FP7, ran from 2007 to 2013, and focused on efforts on translational research with the aim of bringing newly generated knowledge in the biomedical area through to clinical and industrial applications. FP7 has supported over a thousand collaborative projects worth around 5.5 billion euro in a wide range of health research topics. Many of these projects have led to remarkable achievements, including, for example, a genomic prognostic test to avoid unnecessary and expensive treatment in breast cancer patients, meaning that women get the right treatment where appropriate, but don't receive unnecessary therapeutics when they're unsuitable. Another example is a promising new antibiotic compound, which was developed by an SME and recently licensed to Roche Pharmaceuticals, a large pharmaceutical company, in a deal worth hundreds of million of euro, demonstrating how EU support can be both good for healthcare and good for business. In fact, we've also launched new policy initiatives under FP7 to further industrial competitiveness and the exploitation of research outcomes and to boost employment in the health sector. FP7 was a very successful stepping stone on the, on the way to the new challenge-based approach at European level under Horizon 2020, the new European Framework Programme for Research, which, as you know, began earlier this year and will continue until 2020. To my mind, the most important reason for collaborating on health research at a European level is to benefit from the critical mass of excellent scientists and resources which are necessary to tackle huge and expensive challenges. We can only win the fight against antimicrobial resistance, rare diseases, obesity and neurodegenerative diseases if we pool knowledge across research disciplines, across the public and private sectors, and across borders. Europe leads the way with its bold, ambitious approach. Take, for example, the Innovative Medicines Initiative, or IMI, the public-private partnership between the EU and the European pharmaceutical industry, which jointly funds research to accelerate the development of new medicines and improve industrial competitiveness. The huge cost of developing new drugs demands this kind of creative collaboration. Working together at EU level also means that we can avoid wasteful duplication. The Joint Programming Initiative on Neurodegenerative Diseases was the first of its kind, piloting a new strategic coordination of member states' own research agendas. And since most health challenges are global in nature, it pays for Europe to work with international partners. A good example of global cooperation is the European and Developing Clinical Trials Partnership, 
or EDCTP, which is a joint initiative that unites experts from 16 European countries with 30 sub-Saharan countries. It really is a cornerstone of the EU's global engagement in health research. It has already funded 60 clinical trials in Africa, concentrating on HIV, AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis. I was privileged to see the work of the partnership myself in South Africa two years ago in the company of Grasa Carvalho, and I was deeply impressed by the quality of the work and cooperation that we saw on the ground there. So much has been achieved in the last decade. Indeed, the long history of medical research is a story of success upon success, particularly over the last century. People have never lived as long or as well. But the story is not all rosy. We're beginning to see downsides to all this progress. Sophisticated diagnostic methods and therapies and the fantastic improvements in health and longevity have all contributed to mushrooming health costs. As we all know, and we've been reminded of it today on a number of occasions, Europe is getting older. By 2060, the over 65s will have doubled in number, and we will have three times as many people over 80. While this is great news, it brings challenges like the inevitable increase in the incidence of neurodegenerative diseases. At the same time, cancer, cardiovascular diseases, mental illness, and chronic diseases such as diabetes are posing a huge burden in terms of human suffering and in terms of the strain on our health services. New problems are emerging and some old ones are re-emerging. We are seeing worrying incidences of antibiotic resistance, the resurgence of tuberculosis, and many lifestyle-related disorders. So how can we stay healthy in the face of all these challenges? Complex as this question is, one thing is clear, research and innovation are at the root of the answer. Research improves our understanding of health, disease, and aging, and innovation translates this knowledge into effective products and services for the benefit of all of us. And what is healthy for people in Europe can also be good for our economy. The new products and technologies developed to keep us well can also create new opportunities for innovative European companies. Innovation in our health services can ensure the latest treatments reach those who need them while also making the best use of scarce resources. In fact, it's no exaggeration to say that the health service and the health sector is at the vanguard of creative new research and innovation policies at European level. I already mentioned the joint programming initiative on neurodegenerative, neurodegenerative diseases and IMI, the first initiatives of their kind, and we continue to launch new innovative ways to tackle health challenges. One of the first actions under the Innovation Union flagship was the launch of the first of five European innovation partnerships on active and healthy aging. The partnership pilots a new way of working with innovation across sectors to achieve a clearly defined goal. In this case, policymakers, health services, business and universities work together to translate innovative ideas into tangible products and services that respond to the concrete needs of older people. The goal is to add two healthy life years to the average lifespan of Europeans by 2020. 2020 is, of course, also the end date of Horizon 2020, the EU's 80 billion euro research and innovation program, which was launched last year. Building on the seven framework programs of research that preceded it, Horizon 2020 ushers in many improvements and reforms to how we support research and innovation at the European level. Two of the most important 
are the provision of support at every stage from frontier research to new products and services and an approach that focuses on societal challenges rather than scientific disciplines. These twin novelties will serve health research and innovation very well. With 1 billion euro per year, the societal challenge, health, demographic change and well-being is the largest in terms of budget. This will enable us to support hundreds of collaborative research projects and other flagship programs like the second IMI and the second EDCTP. Personalized healthcare and healthy aging are the two focal points of this societal challenge with the goals of providing the right prediction, prevention and treatment strategies to the right person at the right time. But our responses to health challenges cannot only be technological. As we're dealing with people and their needs, social innovation is equally important. This is why the social sciences and humanities have been fully integrated into our research agenda for the first time. Research funded within the health challenge will also contribute to our understanding of how diet, lifestyle and environmental factors can affect health and well-being and reduce healthcare costs and inequalities in the long term. Ensuring food security will be another major factor in keeping us healthy and this goes beyond merely ensuring a sufficient supply it also concerns access to safe and nutritious food. The challenge is how to meet consumers' needs and preferences while minimizing negative impacts on health and the environment. Horizon 2020 supports research and innovation in this area under the challenge on food security, agriculture and the bioeconomy and creating innovative eco-solutions for healthy and green societies also needs to be on our research and innovation agenda, not just for the benefit of the environment, but also for their positive effect on people's health and well-being. Research on this is funded under another of Horizon 2020's challenges on climate action, the environment, resource efficiency and raw materials. Another important development is the systematic use of foresight as a tool to help set Horizon 2020's strategic priorities. The Commission has launched several foresight actions to identify the key future research and innovation challenges cutting across different fields, including at the interface between health, the environment and the bioeconomy. I hope that these examples of how EU-funded research and innovation can help us stay healthy and are useful for today's uh, discussion. Of course, this is only one piece of the puzzle. You'll hear from our expert panelists how they see science, technology and innovation contributing to better health and well-being for everyone in Europe. Just before I finish, I wanted to say that I have had the most wonderful four and a half years representing the European Union in the area of research, innovation and science. I have been supported by a fantastically experienced personal team who work in my own office and very especially by a fantastically professional team that work in two directorates general that I had the privilege to represent and work with, DG Research and Innovation and DG JRC. Today I'm delighted that the Director General of the JRC, Vladimir Shucha, is here with us and that the JRC have been very closely um, involved in the organisation and support to this particular conference. But when one leaves after four and a half years of doing a lot of hard work and I hope achieving what the stakeholders wanted us to achieve, one is very anxious to hand the baton over to someone that you have confidence in will be able to continue and build on all of that hard work. And as I sat up in my bed in New York at three o'clock in the morning last week and watched a young Portuguese politician, Carlos Moedes, 
sit before the Parliament for three full hours of, I suppose, about 64 questions on every aspect and every part of the portfolio, I couldn't have been prouder of my successor. I think Portugal should be extremely proud that he was one of the few commissioners designate who got through right away and got an almost unanimous support from the committee to whom he will work over the next five years. Carlos, it has been my pleasure. It has been my pleasure, Carlos, in the last number of weeks to get to know you a little bit. I will watch from my open fire with my slippers on over the next five years as you continue to build on and develop even better research and innovation policies for Europe. So good luck and thank you.